My khutbah today is taken from chapter 2, verse 183 of Al-Quran. Often read and very well-known verse of the Quran and it deals with fasting. The English translation is as follows. O you who believe, fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed to those before you, so that you may guard against evil. Welcome to our viewers in the virtual mosque and to those who are joining us here today in Juma. This is the last Friday in the, in the holy month of Ramadan and we are privileged to live and witness this day. I've just recited to you chapter 2 verse 183 of Al-Quran. Some translators translate the verse slightly different. Some say that it is read as that you may become righteous, that you may practice self-restraint. Others say that you may develop discipline. All of these meanings, however, have an implication for us as a result of fasting. A few days ago, I was driving to work and the car behind me was very close and the motorcycle in front of me was speeding. It dawned upon me, why are we doing this? Why are we going against the speed limit? Where are we rushing to get to? I realized in essence that we are fighting for our food. And this is the topic that I want to discuss with you today. We often say God is beneficent, God is merciful. The Quran says God feeds us and he does not require food from us. But how often do we think of our existence in relation to our food? In chapter 20 verse 132 of Al-Quran it states, we ask not of thee a sustenance, we provide for thee. When we awake in the morning and we rush to the bathroom, we change, we pray, sometimes we may have something to eat and we hit the traffic. Has it ever occurred to us that we are essentially entering into a fight for food and resources? In the battle to arrive at work on time, and not to incur the criticisms of our boss, we learn a new form of hand signals which we show to other drivers. We may learn new routes to work so we can escape some of the traffic. Essentially, we are fighting for our daily, weekly, monthly and yearly sustenance. We say we love our job. If that is the case, why not do it for free? The answer simply is because we need food. We exchange labor for wages in order to buy food for ourselves and our family. But who is the ultimate provider? It is our nourisher and sustainer, the Lord of the worlds, Allah. To bring out the divine in us, Allah in his infinite mercy has ordained a break from food and drink and other bodily desires and he has called it in Arabic siyam it means abstention an institution as old as mankind itself an institution which is to be found in all religions in some form or fashion let us look at a few in Judaism Yom Kippur is the day of judgment of atonement it is one of the most important days in the Jewish calendar Fasting along with prayer is prescribed as a means of repentance. The one who is fasting may not eat food, drink, brush his hair or teeth, or even take a bath. In Hinduism, we also see several different aspects of fasting. They keep away from certain types of food, they have special diets, and some of them eat nothing at all. Interestingly, in Sanskrit, the word used for fasting is upavasa, meaning upa means in meaning near and vasa means to stay. The, bringing the two meanings together simply means to stay close to God. Here again we see the concept of nearness to God through fasting in what is considered to be one of the oldest religions, if not the oldest religion in the world. In Christianity too, we read in the Bible in Luke chapter 5 verse 33, 
And they said to him, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayer, and so the disciples of the Pharisees. Jesus said, When you fast, be not like the hypocrites of sad countenance. In other words, don't walk about showing people your sad face so that people know that you're fasting. But when you fast, anoint your head and your face. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. Buddhism, however, has an interesting take on fasting. The word used for fasting is hundanga, and it means to shake up or to invigorate. Indeed, one of the benefits of fasting in Islam is to invigorate or shake up or awaken our spiritual self. So we see again similarities in the different faiths. This practice which pertains to food involves eating once a day, that is in Buddhism, or eating at one sitting. These practices are adopted by individuals voluntarily. It is not a part of Buddhism that you should fast. They are not required to do so as normal practice, as a normal Buddhist practice. However, how did the Buddha's own experience influence the Buddhist approach to fasting? The Buddha's spiritual awakening is directly related to fasting, but from the reverse side. What does this mean? In the course of his practice, he realized that desire was the root of mortality. We all desire something. We want to become somebody. We want to have a better car. We want to have better health. We want our children to do well. We all have desires. So the Buddha said, well, desire was the root of mortality. And he determined although incorrectly, that if he had stopped eating, he could end desire and gain liberation from suffering. It is because we desire things, we exert ourselves to get that thing. So he said, well, if I could kill my desire, I could end my suffering. As the story goes, he ate only one grain of rice and one sesame seed per day. Over time, he got so thin that he could touch his spine by pressing on his stomach. He no longer had the strength to meditate. He realized that he would die before he had understood his mind. Further, he realized that desire does not end by force. How interesting is this concept? Desire does not end by force. At that point, a young herdsmaid offered him a meal of milk porridge, which he accepted. He regained his strength, renewed his meditation, and realized his Buddhahood. So by quitting fasting and eating in moderation, he realized the central tenet of Buddhism practice, which is moderation in everything. This resonates with the hadith of the Holy Prophet Muhammad wasallam, when he said, I fast and I break my fast. Also, Allah says in Quran, I desire not hardship for you, but ease. Chapter 5, verse 6. Another verse in the Quran says, Eat and drink, but do not exceed the limits. So here we see the Buddha exceeding the limits of not eating, <coughs> wanting to kill his desire and to attain proper mortality. Islam, Allah says in the Quran, You are the Ummatan Wasatan. You are the people of the middle course. And he has given you guidance in this Quran. So what is the goal of the fast? And why is it for one month consecutively? Anything practiced for one month consecutively has the effect of becoming a part of you, as it were. A well-known quote from Zig Ziglar. This is what he said. Repetition is the mother of learning, the father of action, which makes the architect of accomplishment. Repetition, doing something over and over, is the mother of learning, the father of action, which makes the architect of accomplishment. Fasting for one month, for one month consecutively helps us to learn that we can control all our desires, even though thirst and hunger Similarly, shared by the animals drives them to find food and water. We have those desires. We can control them by repetition. When we learn how to control our animal instincts, then our salat, 
our zikr, our charity. We become, therefore, the architects of self-discipline, of self-restraint and righteousness. This accomplishment in Arabic is called taqwa. The knowledge of the divine being reveals itself in this institution of fasting. But if you study religion, you will understand that it also reveals itself in pilgrimage, in sacrifice, and in zakat. The merciful God says to Muslims, take a break from food and focus on service to mankind. Essentially, in this month, we should give up we should give to our brothers what we need and want for ourselves. Similarly, we read in the Bible, do to others as you would have them do unto you, in Luke chapter 6, verse 31. To most people nowadays, this is an alien concept. And they question, why should I give my hard-earned cash and food to someone whom I do not know and who does not know me? It's easier and cheaper for me to love them. Interestingly, the internet alleges that the word love occurs more times in the Bible than in the Quran. Unfortunately, love does not ease the pangs of hunger or quench the thirst. What better way to serve humanity than to experience their suffering? Our giving, therefore, can be limitless. We see a good example in Hazrat Abu Bakr when he gave all that he had for the service of humanity. When he was asked by the Prophet, what have you left for your family? He said, I left Allah and his Rasul. In this example of Hazrat Abu Bakr, can love for your brother or for humanity be any greater? Abdullah ibn Salam, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated, when the Prophet arrived for the first time in Medina, I went with everyone to see him. When I saw him, I knew his face was not that of a liar. The first words he said were, O oh people, feed the hungry. Spread salam. Maintain your kin relationship. And pray at night while others are asleep. With this, you shall enter heaven in peace. This is reported in Al-Bukhari. We are asked in this month to make extra supplication, especially to pray for guidance and forgiveness, to give more charity, to feed the fasting, as there is great blessing in these humanitarian acts of devotion. While fasting is for Allah, and He is the one who rewards it, the giving of charity, the feeding of the poor, the giving of your hard-earned cash and food, when in these difficult times you need it, Allah is trying to illuminate within us the latent quality of giving and sharing, to bridge the gap of needs for oneself over the needs of the community. This was the pinnacle of the life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad wasallam, and we read in the Quran in chapter 53 verse 9, so he was a measure of two bows or closer still. The lesson is therefore that we too, if we are followers of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we should emulate him in establishing a bond with God and an equal bond with mankind. This is what taqwa is all about. The needs of the community over your needs. This is selflessness. This is this is a quality of all great leaders. Jesus fed 5,000 with a few fish and a loaf of bread. Our Prophet Muhammad wasallam, regularly went without food and gave away what he had to travelers, and he went hungry. And these two personalities are essentially leaders of two of the greatest religions today. Let us take a step back and look at something very mundane something you may not think about or you may think about occasionally. The food chain in the oceans of the world. The largest creature in the ocean, the whale, depends on the smallest for its sustenance, and that is the krill. The krill, in turn, depends on phytoplankton and zooplankton, microscopic plants and animals. Have you ever thought of the amount of animals in this world and how they get their food? 
from the elephant to the earthworm, from the whale to the krill, who provides for them? Look at every country of the world. They are all fishing the oceans and rivers. Think of every tin of sardine, tuna, and salmon you see in your local supermarket. If you go to Costco, you will see a hundred times that amount. Where does this supply come from? The huge ships that plunder the seabeds every hour of every day. Who provides for the fishes we eat? Where is the supply coming from? Muslims and atheists alike enjoy the flesh of the ocean. In relation to this, the Quran says, And he it is who has made the sea subservient, that you may eat fresh flesh from it, and bring forth from it ornaments which you wear, and you see the ships cleaving through it, and that you might ask for his bounty, and that you may give thanks. Chapter 16, verse 14. Again in chapter 16, verse 18, it states, Allah the merciful, and if you would count Allah's favors, you will not be able to number them. Most surely, Allah is forgiving, merciful. Allah the merciful wanted mankind to be leaders. So he created institutions in religions to develop leadership qualities. But with the passing of time, almost all of these institutions have become defunct. And as such, Allah says in the Quran, surely the religion acceptable to Allah is Islam. Quran chapter 3 verse 19. So these institutions have been in other religions well before Islam. Allah has given these people the opportunity to become leaders, to develop qualities of leadership in them through fasting, through paying of zakat, or giving charity to the poor, through pilgrimage but they just pushed it aside. So we, uh, we are in the process of fighting for our food. We should take time out to remember the provider of this food. Remember those who do not have even clean water to drink, something we don't even think about every day. Allah does not reward our starving for him, but the giving to our fellow man in our time of need. That's the real essence. You not only feel his pain and his pangs of hunger and his thirst, but you say, okay, I understand. Let me, let me give. Let me do what I, I need to do, what my God has asked me to do. In conclusion, may we take with us some of the lessons we have learned from this blessed month of Ramadan into the next 11 months. And may we all become better Muslims together. Amen.